So then we are starting a new course, and the course is called Mechanics of Earthquakes and Tectonic Physics. So this is a course that basically follows the theoretical seismology course. Okay, there's a reason behind this: is that you will see that there will be concepts that you've seen during the theoretical seismology course that will be popping up, that will be coming again. That's why it's important for you guys to. I hope that the exam would be for soon so that you should be this would allow you a little bit to get in depth into the course that you did and this would allow you maybe a little bit to connect the two informations so it's important to connect what you learned in seismology and try to follow up the, what you will be learning during this course so I think that the textbooks are in the library let me just show you the textbooks that I would recommend reading and a uh, big part of this course is based on the following textbook. I mean, Christopher Scholz is, we have the second edition, I think that the third edition now is at the library. Er Earthquake and Volcano Deformation by Paul Segal. Okay. And if you would like to go in depth into the fracture mechanics and the fundamental of rock mechanics and stresses and strains, you can consult these two, these three books as well that are available at the library. The two ones are on the shelves of the diploma program, so you could control them. Then we have the PDF files as well. So for your information, I think that Christopher Scholz is for more, let's say, PhD students or early career scientists where the math is not well developed, while in Paul's book, you get all the, the math, okay? You get the physics and the mathematics there. and. Uh, we were lucky we had Paul Segal visiting ICTP teaching in a course here on physics of volcanoes. So if you Google physics of volcanoes Segal ICTP, you will get all his lecture notes and all his lecture notes are part, do represent part of the book. Okay, so you could have them and then look at them. Okay, they are on the workshop that we did some two, three years ago. Okay. So, let me start with, this would be in some way the slide that we should finish the course with, okay? And this gives you a little bit of an understanding what, what this course is about, okay? It's basically learning about how faults do work, okay, how they behave in time, okay? And how do they interact within a plate boundary? So this should be the backbone of earthquake hazard assessment. So what you've seen in seismology with Fabio Romanelli, basically you've seen more of the point source approximation. He got you into the extended source approximation. Here we will see only the extended source. We will see a fault as a 2D, as a 3D, with even thickness to some extent. Okay? And what will happen is that further to this course you'll get another course that is it's a follow-up to this one where you get all the computational and observational methods okay and furthermore this course connects to the space geodesy and the NSAR course that you had okay and we will be relying on space geodesy and NSAR to understand how faults work so as you did the exam already of the space geodesy course, then you should be now fairly well informed, okay? Then you're well prepared to consume the course, okay? So the second, I would say, most important part of this course who is not webcasted, it will be based on the computer. Basically, this will happen in the, in the computer lab. Okay, you will go, you will, you will play with data sets and then you will do some small models, okay, just to understand it, okay? So this is, this slide basically represents two different things, okay, two different points that I would like to highlight. So let's start from the first that you see on the right hand side. This is exactly what we think on the basis of all the data sets that we have now. Okay, and this is coming from a 
I think that from a lecture of Chris Maron, we're lucky to have Chris Maron now in Italy. Okay, Chris Maron was also a former student of Christopher Scholz, I think. And he's now in Sapienza for some, he's involved in the European project. So what we think is that faults, the same fault, can exhibit an active fault, a fault that generates earthquakes, can exhibit a broad spectrum of strains that start, that basically can go from a full a seismic slip, you know what the word a seismic is, we've defined it in the first semester, it means that the slip is taking place in a time-dependent fashion, okay, is no release of seismic waves, up to an earthquake with a supersonic rupture velocity that you should know what it is, that you had this in your seismology course. You heard this also in the wave physics course in the first semester. It's when the rupture velocity goes over the, a certain percentage of your velocity of the medium, which is 80%, 75%. Then from the seismic slip, we will try and understand, you will see all these different deformation processes, basically, during the course and during the exercises, and this is something that you may also wish to develop during the thesis work, the project work. Some of the former students were basically working even on slow transients or on slow slip earthquakes, trying to model these ones, trying to build very simple mechanical models during the, the project work. Then you see how complex can a fault B. So an active fault behaves in a very complicated way. So these informations, we know them now because we have GPS, we have NSAR, and we have also traditional space geodesy, strain meters and tilt meters, and we have seismology, of course. And these are, this is basically coming from a number of observations that we've been consuming in time. Okay. So then we came a long way in monitoring and modeling earthquake deformation. In the last 20 years, there has been a very strong revolution on how, on our, in our knowledge on how faults are moving. So now this is one single fault that exhibits basically a continuous spectrum of N members, I mean from these two N members, from the fully seismic up to the earthquake with a supersonic rupture velocity. And now if you take this single fault, you put it into a plate boundary. Plate boundaries are made, could be made of a single fault, which is maybe the easiest, it could be the easiest system that we could see. Or it could be made of a number of different faults that are within the plate boundary. Okay. They could be parallel, they could be oblique, they could be extremely complex. We've seen some examples during the first semester. And the second challenge, further to the challenge of understanding how our faults are moving within our earthquake cycle that we will be defining in a minute, we need to understand how these faults, when they are put within the plate boundary, how these faults do accommodate the deformation from the plates. Right? Plate boundary, it's a place where two plates are either colliding or they are basically one going far away from the other one or, you know, or basically moving in a, in a transform way, sliding one past the other one. Right? So these are three different conceptual models by which we have three different faults between Within our plate boundary, this should be plate A, this should be plate B, and then you have three different strike slips here. Specifically, I mean, are drawn three left lateral strike slips. Okay? So, and here we're basically considering what I was telling you that you need always to think in time and space. You need to assess the depth because an earthquake, it's basically an instantaneous, it's a very fast rupture. Okay, that has its own mechanics, that is taking place on a fault that is a geological object that has its own mechanics, 
And this fault is embedded within a media that is called the lithosphere that has also its own mechanics. It's time and space evolutions, okay? So if we look at this first model, this is what we call the distributed model by which your faults are basically stopping, they shut down when they reach the transition from your schizosphere to, to your plastosphere. And we know this thanks to the seismicity, when you plot your seismicity versus depth. But this is not the only thing that we need to know. To know this, we need also to assess how these faults are behaving within the post-seismic deformation. This is something that we will see later on. And the end member model of this distributed deformation scheme, by which faults are, in this specific case, very simple. They are all parallel. But they move because, I mean, they take the engine from the plastosphere, but they do not sample or cut the plastosphere. Okay? So the end member model, or the opposite model to this one, is what we call a localized deformation scheme. It's by which your faults are basically cutting within the blastosphere. As you may see it here, these faults are sampling the, in some ways, the place where, where the engine is, in some ways, where the deformation is coming, where the flow is taking place. Okay? And in between you have conceptual model that could be a very complicated one by which even your plate boundary is, has its own peculiar job, right? So we came with these models. These models, they came out, of course, following a number of earthquakes, but not looking only at the co-seismic deformation, but also by chasing transients on these faults and understanding how do they behave in a, also a time-dependent fashion. This is something that we will see, okay? So if you are then able to know how your fault is moving, how your fault is working within this complex broad spectrum of deformations from the Fourier seismic to the uh, supersonic rupture velocity. You're doing a, already a good job, okay? But furthermore, if you would like to have a good contribution to earthquake hazard, you need to understand how these faults are taking up the deformation within the plate boundary. Okay? And this is the backbone of earthquake hazard. If we understand this, we're already doing great. And all this relies on a number of geological data sets that we will be understanding in a minute. Okay? So now, let's go to the earthquake cycle. So all what you've seen here is based on earthquake cycle studies on faults. It's by putting geological, seismological, and space geodetic data sets, or classical geodetic data sets. Our classical understanding of the earthquake cycle is this one. Sorry, that the first slide came. This is the stress evolution on a single fault without transient deformation, okay? You have an earthquake. You have your stress drop. This is the stress loading before the earthquake. An earthquake happens. And then again, you get into a linear and a steady state, loading up of, the, of your stresses and then a release. This is time versus stress. This is the most simplistic model that someone can consider. However, what we know from rock mechanics experiment, this is an interesting paper by Frost and Ashby, is that if you take a sample and then try to put it into a loading, what your sample, this is the type of behavior that your sample would present, would exhibit in terms of strain versus time. As you may see, you have an early primary creep that looks like a nonlinear one, by which you have a sort of acceleration, and then you get into a steady state behavior. And this would be followed by the secondary creep that is in the specific case steady state, it looks quite linear. And then it ends up 
by a third phase, which is a tertiary preplase also accelerating before the sample starts rupture. Okay? So this is what we know from rock mechanics experiments. Rock mechanics experiments have their limits when you have to apply them to the earthquake cycle. We've discussed this in the first semester. The solution to the problem is to do an earthquake mechanics experiment at the scale of the lithosphere. Okay, but we've learned a big deal out of rock mechanics experiment. This is extremely important for us to, to understand the way these experiments are done and what we learn out of these experiments. This is what we call sort of an analog experiment. And then the same experiments now, you could do them the same experiments. The same context, basically, the same research subject, you could do it numerically with big computers. Okay? So, then this is telling us that this view of the earthquake cycle is too simplistic. Okay? And here we put it even in some ways, it's time predictable, okay, and the size is always the same, by which we're always generating the same size of earthquakes, and these are what we call characteristic earthquakes that we will understand later on what these earthquakes are. So this is very, very simple and too, too easy. Okay? So then we need to account for transients. So this is the view many years ago, before space geodesy or classical geodesy started changing the time dependency of fault motion in time. Now that we have GPS data sets and now that we have rock mechanics experiments, this is the view of the earthquake cycle. This is the way we look at the earthquake cycle. It becomes extremely complicated. This is a figure from Giulio di Torre in 2012. It's a very nice figure. First, you see that your earthquakes are not any more time predictable. They are different in time. Their occurrence is quite complicated. It's our bad news. In terms of earthquake hazard. And the way we view the earthquake cycle now, first we view it also with different quantities, and this, these quantities do relate to the mechanical behavior, right? First quantity is the classical slip versus time, that you see that your slip is also exhibiting this sort of acceleration before the rupture, before you get your earthquake, and then you get into a post-seismic, this is what we call the co-seismic cool phase within your earthquake cycle, this is what we call the pre-seismic phase, then the cool seismic phase is followed by a post seismic phase that we will study later on and then you see that it's also an accelerating phase before you get into your steady state and that this is what we call the inter seismic so the earthquake cycle is made of three different phases okay the cool seismic inter seismic and then the pre seismic right so the way we were viewing the earthquake cycle in the old time is that we were looking at the cool seismic and the interseismic, co-seismic, interseismic, and co-seismic, interseismic. Now, further to this, then you see here, as I say, that you have on pre-seismic accelerating creep that we're trying also to understand now, thanks to some specific topics that we will be developing. We will be looking at specific earthquakes, combining space geodesy and high-resolution earthquake detection location. These are things that you will be doing during the computer method, that you will be looking specifically at these data sets. And you have a post-seismic creep, and this is an extremely important phase, and the post-seismic deformation would allow you to understand also, to make a difference in some ways, whether you're within a sort of a localized deformation scheme or a distributed deformation scheme. In other words, understand whether your fault is sampling the blastosphere or not because you're chasing the time-dependent part, the time-dependent deformation within the fault after the co-seismic, right? So the post-seismic phase is extremely important. So now if we look at it in terms of shear stresses and fault strength, then an earthquake is basically a loading versus a fault strength, okay? Then stronger is the fault, then less earthquake we will have, maybe but at some point the false strength will not be able to sustain the elastic restoring forces and there will be rupture. And this will get us into the 
most important parameter that we study in this specific case. It is called friction, right? So, then in terms of stresses, what you see during the cold seismic is that you have your seismic static stress drop. Fabio has already defined this, and he has already defined, I guess, the dynamic one, but we will be looking at it again. And then you have the post-seismic healing phase. Your rupture is healing up. The rupture can already heal even during the rupture itself. I mean, you have, you know, when your front is propagating, you may have healing processes taking place while the earthquake is still going on. But the most important healing that we will be developing here are healing when the friction really start to recover. And then when you get into the post-seismic phase, you see that the, the, there is a healing of the system and your friction is recovering, is getting into its static values. So, then as you can see now, the, the earthquake cycle is a complicated object. It's not an easy one. And here we're not including yet one part of the typical deformations that you would see, which are basically either slow earthquakes or slow slip motions, okay? And we will see these slow slip motions both within subduction zones later on and continental faults and continental regions. When it goes to data sets, if you say that I'm working on the earthquake cycle, then you should be a person that is able to put different data sets into into work. You need to understand geology and geological time scales. Here we're talking about quaternary time, Pleistocene, looking at river terraces, looking at marine terraces that are uplifted or that are deformed, looking at shorelines, looking at de deformations within the geological record but the recent one, of course, we're not talking about old geological stuff. And then you get into paleoseismology, but before you get into this, you could even rely on geomorphology. Geomorphology is basically the science that looks at the landscape at the morphology of the structures. Each fault is basically an active fault, should be a shallow active fault, should be controlling the surface topography, should be controlling the drainage pattern, Okay, and here we're getting into time scales that are far larger than the classical time scales of the earthquake catalog or one single earthquake cycle. And when we get into paleoseismic data sets, here by paleoseismic data sets, you will see some examples. This is basically taking a fault that has reached the surface during a coseismic rupture. And then you go and dig a trench across it and try to retrieve er paleo earthquakes that took place within a time scale that maybe was not observed by historians or by that was not reported within the historical record, within the man based record, okay, the woman based record, right? And then here we're getting into historical seismology. Historical seismology is basically reported using intensities, okay? So there are people that reported about specific earthquakes that took places, that took place in, in different places in the world, okay? When a, you have a damaging earthquake that took place nearby Trieste, we have an earthquake that took place in 1511. And this 1511 earthquake was fairly well described by both historians and the locals and different, even individual people that were reporting in their diaries or they were describing what happened. On the base of this, a historical seismologist would be able to put all the information together and start by defining a damage map, what we call an intensity map. And on the base of this, this gives us basically, this would give us a little bit of an understanding of where the earthquake took place, okay? and even give some constraint on the geometry of the fault, give some constraints on what happened, even on site-specific effect, specific site um, deformations that took place during the earthquake, okay? 
And what we will be looking, we will be looking very much during the class is the instrumental part. The instrumental part is, is our non-direct observations. These are observations that are made by the instruments for yourself. And this gets into seismology, space geodesy, or classical geodesy, or anything else that should be quantifying in a very serious way with uncertainties what happens, what is going on, what did happen during the earthquake, and how it, the earthquake fault is, is deforming in time. So, if we put this into a context, then here we're talking about 10 to the power of 5. If you go to geological data sets, if you go to paleoseismic data sets, the C14 dating cannot give you a good resolution if you go over 30,000 years or 40,000 years. You may require, you may rely on other dating techniques. And this is something that we will not develop, but we will see this in a specific topic during the course. And then when you get into paleoseismology, then you're getting, basically, you're looking at the earthquake cycle from a geological viewpoint because you're going to the fault itself. And then you're trying to retrieve the elapse of time since the last earthquake, for instance. Okay? If the fault has moved recently, then what you do is that you try to find the earthquake that happened before the instrumental one. Or if, even better, is to recognize a fault that still did not move, that we are expecting that this fault would generate a large earthquake, and then you go and dig a trench and find the elapsed time on that fault of an earthquake that took place within 1,000 years ago or 500 years ago. And this is a fantastic and a very important contribution to earthquake hazard, right? So this is what we call paleoseismology. And the time span here, of course, which is of 10,000 to 10, 1,000 year ago. And historical seismicity goes back to the history of the mankind, of humans, right? While the instrumental part of, of seismology, instrumental seismology started in the 70s, okay? In 1977, 1976. In 1976, we got the early DGSN, okay? And from that time, I think that seismology has been improving, seismometry has been increasingly improving. And now we're in the time of fiber optics, where we're using fiber optics as, you know, the sections that are with a number of seismographs that are distributed along these fiber optics. And on this line, you see, of course, the strain rates. Okay, these are the deformation then faster is your plate boundary. Then here we're basically looking at different contexts. This is a plate boundary scheme by which you have two plates that are colliding or you know extending and the plate boundary are, are basically moving in a transform fashion. And the strain rates are quite high within regions like subduction zones. They are slower. In Italy, for instance, we have strain rates are not huge or not big. They are not of the order of the San Andreas or Turkey or Greece. Okay? We're talking about a few millimeters per year while other plate boundaries are accommodating centimeters per year. And then slower the rates are, then we get into what we call active plate interiors. These are basically intraplate this is what we call intraplate earthquakes. Okay, these are earthquakes that are taking place inside the plate. Okay, and we will talk about this. We will understand now that there is a new way of looking at faults within what we call also stable continental regions. Okay, it seems like these faults do have a completely different behavior. In the old time, we were considering faults inside the plates or in, in, in stable continental regions as faults that do have a very, 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 very slow slip rate, okay, then this means that they obey the uh, general picture of the earthquake cycle that I've shown you. But now we're starting to realizing that it seems like these faults do obey a completely different scheme that we will be defining later on, okay? So, 
let's get into a little bit a more detailed picture here. Which is this one, this is by Seth Stein. So here basically what we're putting, we're putting a little bit more detail into all the type of data sets that we should be relying on if we think we would, have, we would like to have a very good constraint on the earthquake hazard or on the seismogenic potential within a region of interest. Okay, then the time here is going to a million. It's coming, it's starting from zero here. And if we have to go to a million, then here we rely on structural geology. Structural geology is a geology that represents the structure. By structural geology, you could look at anticlines, you could look at synclines, you could look at deformed layers, okay? You could look at fault-related folding processes. You could rely on geological, but this is still recent geology, hopefully within pliocoternary sediments or within very recent sediments, and try to chase the deformation within the sediments to understand on the behavior, on the long-term behavior of active faults. You could rely on plate motion, and this is something that you've seen during the talk of uh, Giampiero Iafaldano. I mean, Giampiero told you that he relies on plate motion even to identify places where the strain loading is going on because you cannot know where all the faults are. This is a clever thinking. It's an interesting uh, procedure, but it has also its limits. I mean, the physics is very elegant. But when it goes to its application to earthquake hazard, there are still things that need to be accounted for, as he highlighted. And then another proxy that is very important if you would like to understand deformation within a, a plate boundary region is topography. Topography is the most, if you wish, the most recent, recent geological record of what the deformation should be. Okay, and topography has different wavelengths. Okay, if you look at the topography within the wavelength of a fault, then you need to stick to the to tens of kilometers nearby the fault. It depends on the geometry of your faulting, of course. While the long wavelength topography that you see here might be something that is connected to what we call dynamic topography, and this is something that we discussed a little bit in the first semester, but we will not be getting into it. So another important feature that still remains within a very large time span is called tectonic geomorphology, looking at how geomorphology is controlled by the tectonics. You can see river beds that are completely deflected, and they are deflected not because the river decided to deflect itself, but the fault is deflecting the river, and the continuous motion and the co-seismic deformation on specific faults do change the track of river flows, okay? And this is something that we've seen in real time following earthquakes. We'll always remember the 1980 earthquake in North Africa, 7.3, that with a thrust fault and reverse fault that I've shown you in the first semester, that has created basically like a dam behind it. It had water that the river was completely stopped, the flow of the river was stopped by the, the fault that cut the surface, and this has created a flood. All the plain was completely flooded. And it took ages for the flood to, to restart its own path again. It had to erode the scarp, but not only the scarp, but it had to go also through all the anticline that went upward. Okay? And this is what we call the short wavelength of the topography that you see within, that is connected to the motion of the fault. Because the reverse fault, it's not only slip on the fault, but it's also an anticline that is deforming. If the anticline deforms, then it scales with the geometry of the fault. Okay? Now, getting shorter in time, we're getting 2,000 years to recent years. And this is called paleoseismology. This is something that we've already define it. I hope that we will be able to do a field trip. Last year, I don't know, maybe two years ago, we did a field trip. We've seen a trench in action. We did trenches here, so 
but I don't know, I don't think that this year we will be able to show, to show you fresh trenches, but I mean, the course is not, this, this course is not on paleo seismology, but you need to understand the way paleo seismologists do work and understand the limits and the uncertainties of their results, if you would like to include them into your work. And then here we're getting into the part that we will be further developing during this course, and this is the instrumental part. Here you see that seismology and geodesy are put within a time span of 100 to 10,000 years. This includes basically even uh, from paleo seismology to seismology, you could, you could use what we call archaeo seismology in the Mediterranean. This is seismology through archaeological sites. If you go to archaeological sites, Roman sites, for instance, in Northern Africa and Italy, you would see that there are specific uh, built structures by the Romans, by our ancestors in North Africa, for instance, that are deformed by past earthquakes. And the record is still available. It's up to you to go and measure it and look at it and understand it. So this is a very respectable field but that is quite complicated, but you need to understand it. Okay, it provides good constraints on recent on earthquakes that happened within the archaeological park. And then you get into seismology. This, of course, includes historical seismology. This is why the timing looks looks quite big. And then you get into geodesy. The geodesy here includes both what we call traditional geodesy, and we will see that geodesy is a field that started thousand years ago. Okay. And then now we're lucky to have space geodesy, but traditional geodesy remains still a respectable field, a very respectable one, okay? And the uncertainties to some extent are even far more uh, performing than the space geodesy uncertainties, which are really complicated, that need to be in understood seriously. So, then, if you would like to work on earthquake recurrence, on the earthquake cycle, then you need to understand all this. Okay? Of course, you would get specialized within this part, but if you would like to work on the earthquake cycle, I say it again, you need to understand the data sets and the way scientists within these different fields are working. And the integration is the solution to the problem. So if we would like to put this into a perspective, this is exactly what happens. I mean, here we're looking at a picture of the San Andreas, and this is the plate motion. The San Andreas is this big feature that you see here. It controls the drainage pattern. Then you see geomorphology or tectonic geomorphology, and you see the plate motion. This is North America versus the Pacific that moves at a rate of 36 millimeter per year. And you see how the San Andreas is both controlling the landscape, the geology, and also the recent deformation here. And then the most recent deformation is, are these ones. This is the Bollywood seismic record. This is a very fresh offset on a deflected river when it reaches the right lateral strength slip. And then you see the offset here. So you could go and measure the offset and dig trenches both across and perpendicular to follow the channels of the old river and then date those ones and come out with a record, a paleoseismic record of how many earthquakes took place within this specific scheme. And this is extremely robust. Okay? Till we get into something that could be as a historical seismology. This is the, the fan that was cut by the 1906. And this shows you exactly what a co-seismic displacement looks like by a picture that was taken at that time. Okay? Then if you have, if you're lucky in your region, you have these pictures by people that were, that have seen something that is quite anomalous in 1906. We didn't have plenty of seismologists, so there was someone there, that, a geologist in the specific case, that understood that there is a fault, and then he took this picture showing the displacement. Okay? So now, this is just uh, basically an appetizer on what earthquakes and tectonics could be. Okay, this is tectonic seismology, if you wish, or call it these tectonic seismology, tectonic geodesy, tectonic geomorphology, and tectonics in a geological sense. 
or earthquake geology. Well, what we'll be doing during this course will be mainly physics oriented. And we will get here into the physics of faults. There are two types of processes that we see on active faults. We see what we call a stick slip that you've already seen. You know what stick slip is. Okay? It's one of it's the fault is stuck during the interseismic and it slips during the cool seismic. Versus the stable sliding that we will be defining as well. Stable sliding is your time dependent deformation. Okay? And these are very simple measures that you need to have on the, in, the, in the back of your mind if you would like to understand and if you would like to talk and interact with people. You know that most of you are physicists, so you should be are, you are newcomers in seismology, but you, could under, you need to understand now you know what a moment magnitude is after the course in seismology, a moment magnitude of 4.4 and 5. These are really a few centimeters of average slip on a fault that is a continental fault that is taking place within a shallow crust, within your upper crust. A moment magnitude 7, here we're talking about a few meters of average slip on the fault. Then these are the entities and the quantities that you would expect. And a magnitude 9 could be 10 to the 20, 10 to 20 meters of average slip. And here we're talking about big monsters like the ones that you've seen already in the first semester, like Sumatra, Tohoku, Chile, Alaska, these big mega earthquakes. So this is the co-seismic deformation. These are basically this is, these are values that should be used as a reference frame for you. At the same time, you need also to bear in mind that the time-dependent deformation on the faults that do generate these earthquakes could vary from millimeters to centimeters per year. Okay. And we will see the way we assess the slip rates of these faults in a time-dependent fashion. So this could be your slip rate, the way you assess your slip rate using both geology and geodesy, and you will see that the procedures might, are completely different. And when you compare them, you need to account for the differences in the way, in the way they are taken. Okay? So, then we say that an earthquake in this specific course for us, the definition of an earthquake, is a slip on a discontinuity, which is a fault. Okay? We will not rely much on seismic waves, as you did it during the seismology course, but we will rely a lot on measuring slip, on understanding how slip is distributed, slip history on a fault during the go seismic, or how slip is distributed during the time dependency, during the time dependency phase of the fault activity. So, as we said, we have two types of slip. The first one is the stick slip. This is the soil the so-called seismic slip, or the co-seismic, where two sides of the interface are stuck together thanks to friction. And when the slip occurs, it's basically because the friction is overcome by the elastic restoring forces. And here, the slip is controlled by dynamic friction and then healing, okay? And these are things that we will understand also in a few minutes. While the stable sliding, which is this, is basically sh very short in time. This is during the time span of an earthquake. There are seconds and minutes, depending on the size of the earthquake specifically. While the stable sliding is anything that is time dependent, which requires time. And here we have, this is used, the word that is used is a seismic. If you are a mechanicist, you should stick to this wording, stable sliding and stick slip. The word seis a seismic a little bit, there is an abuse in the use of a seismic. I don't like the word myself because it could mean two different things. It could mean basically stable sliding or creeping. As it could mean, I mean, if you say that this is a seismic, it means that you have no seismicity. So you need to be careful. Okay, there are seismologists that always mix the two. They say, well, this is an a seismic region. It means that this is a region that does not exhibit earthquakes. Okay? But the mechanical description is the stable sliding versus the stick slip. And we will be using other words that are more mechanically oriented depending on the behavior of friction. So if we get into friction, the first person that started looking at friction is called Leonardo da Vinci. 
So Leonardo is the name of this building where you are right now. Okay, he's our favorite uh, person. He's a type of person that mixes engineering, science, art, and beauty of nature. Okay, so this is the wording that he used, and then the, there will not be friction anymore, and the sound will cease, and the tensors will stop. So friction is the parameter when it goes to understanding issues that regard the dynamics of form. The first, the analog that we use in physics for the earthquake cycle is called the spring slider. Some people use the Burridge Kropov model. Okay, Burridge Kropov, Burridge. These are two different scientists. I was lucky to know Knopov myself. Knopov unfortunately passed away. He was a famous physicist that was doing seismology. He's uh, also, he was playing violin as well. So he was a musician as well. So he was mixing acoustics and, uh, and seismic waves, right? So the Birch Knopov model, this is the analog of your earthquake cycle by which you have a mass that is sliding over a surface. Then the interaction between your mass and, and your surface should be your fault. And there should be a spring here that we do not see. And the spring should represent the lithosphere that you're loading up. So that if you pull your spring, your mass will not move yet. You need first to load your spring till your mass starts moving. And the mass will start moving when your elastic restoring forces are bigger than the frictional, basically, the frictional forces that are opposing to the motion. And here you see it, the block is held in place because friction that is shown by this vector is stronger than the elastic restoring forces. At some point we start loading the points and then we're increasing our elastic restoring forces moving the load point does increase your elastic restoring forces and then we get slip basically as you see here the block has moved when your elastic restoring forces exceed your frictional forces and this is your earthquake and here we're getting into the instability this is a very simple analog that works, that works quite perfect. Now this would be the first thing that you have to model, that we would be asking you to model. You have to write a routine and look at the earthquake cycle by playing with one block and playing with different blocks. That would, each block would, each interface between the block and the surface would present a fault. And if you have two blocks, then these would be two faults. You could connect the two blocks so you could see how faults do interact. Or you could have blocks that are connected to your plate boundaries or blocks that are distributed within two plates and see how do they move. Of course, at some point, I mean, the earthquake has to stop and the earthquake stops when friction recovers. Friction has to recover, luckily, okay, so the earthquake terminates. And we will try to understand how all this happens. So when we get into the instability, okay, then an earthquake is a frictional instability. It's an instability within your friction. The process here, we call it velocity weakening. By velocity weakening, you just need to understand what the word is. We've already defined it, I think, in the first semester, but we'll redefine it. It's friction that is weakening with the velocity, right? This is what we call velocity weakening. And if you have to say, hey, well, this is an earthquake, then you can say that this is a velocity weakening process. Okay, a mechanical description of an earthquake would be that one. And I think that there will be basically a uh, a plot that explains this a little bit better. So the velocity weakening is basically the part where your earthquake is going on. And the other process 
by which we have your hour stable sliding, then the velocity weakening process regards the stick slip, while the velocity strengthening regards the time dependency, and the velocity strengthening is when your friction is getting stronger with the velocity. Okay? And specifically with time. You will see that your static friction, when it recovers, it heals up. So when the system heals up. So if we go and start with friction before we get into these processes, okay, and now we understood that a stable sliding should be defined by a process by which our friction should be healing up in some ways, or it should be stable over time, or when we have a velocity weakening, it means that we're in the stick slip domain. Before we get into this, let's look at friction itself. Friction is very simple. It's expressed in terms of a coefficient. It's a ratio between your shear stress to the normal force that is required. To initiate a sliding surface, to initiate a sliding first surface, here we talk about internal friction. It means that you still do not have your fault, that you're creating it or initiate sliding on the surface, then the surface exists, and there you initiate your sliding. And here we talk about static friction, and we also talk about maintaining sliding on the surface during an earthquake, and this is what we call dynamic friction. So there are three different types of frictions that you need to bear in mind. An internal friction, which is basically the initiation of your sliding surface. And I would invite you to read this paper by Savage et al. is Internal Friction Friction. Okay, it's a very interesting paper and a very simple one that you could look at that remains still timely. Very simple plot to understand what friction is. This is your fr frictional surface, this is your fault, then it's a ratio between your shear and your normal stress. Your normal stress is perpendicular to your fault, your shear stress is parallel, it acts parallel to the surface, and the ratio between these two quantities would give you your friction. Amantan law, you've seen it with Fabio, I'm sure, and we've seen it even maybe in the first semester. This goes back to 1699. The frictional force, the take home message from Amantan law, is that the frictional force is independent of the surface contact area. Okay, and this is a strong assumption as we will see later on. And the frictional force is proportional to the normal load. Then this is your shear stress is equal mu sigma n. So this is your shear stress, Pascal, and this is your coefficient of friction, that is mu, and this is your normal stress. A way to look and test to frictional experiments, these are the four different ways, okay. This is our spring slider analog, by which you could try and measure friction by this, by playing with this. And you have another more sophisticated way that we will also see in detail later on. And you have this system that we call our rotary system. And then you have even a triaxial that goes into engineering procedures. Okay, by which you could look at frictional properties of your sliding surfaces. If we have to get into frictional experiments that would mimic the time scale of an earthquake, what would be the most reasonable way of looking at it among the four different approaches? Number four, no. It could be B, or better. What is the seismic slip velocity of an earthquake? You did not study this in seismology, but we'll get into these quantities as well. What is the dimension of a seismic slip velocity? It's meters per second, right? We know this. We did this in the first semester to some extent. So if you would like to reach meters per second, that now the apparatus that are developed here, even in Italy, in Japan, in Italy, in the US, 
a system that would allow you to reach this are either B or C, and preferably C, which is a rotary system. A rotary system, it's a system by which you put your granite here inside another granite and then you rotate this one that is embedded within another granite, but you can rotate it very fast. Okay, and there you can look at the frictional properties. Okay, you could basically look at different videos done by on YouTube. You could put rotary, rock mechanics, frictional experiments, and then I think that Giulio Di Toro has put some of his videos online that you could see what happens. Where you would see flash heating that is taking place. And we'll understand what flash heating is. So when it goes to the BioLilo, Bio low tells us that this is a very simple plot by which we put normal stress versus shear stress. That you're basically, when you are within small values of your normal versus shear stress, the relationship is shear stress equal to 0 0.85 sigma n. When you go to larger values here, then it's 0 0.5 constant plus 0 0.6 sigma n. So then low stress regions are represented by this empirical relationship, while in high stress regions you would use, you would rely mainly on this. But you will see that these ones are quite limited. What we've learned out of laboratory studies is this, out of our analog experiment. If you look at the analog experiment, and here now we're plotting it as a force versus displacement. And uh, what you see in green is basically your frictional surface here. You would see that your friction would drop down earlier than a system would respond. On the system, the slope of the system is this one. And if this happens, it means that there is a characteristic distance over which friction starts acting. Okay? Drop it getting into its dynamic values. This is what we call D sub C, or a critical distance. Okay, and this is something that we will be defining as well. If we go to the second order variations of frictions, and these are aspects that were first described by Rabinovich in 1951, 1956, and 1958, and he was describing what static versus dynamic friction and state dependency of your friction. And the state dependency regards maybe the dependency of time, I mean a memory system, while the rate dependency that we will see depends on the velocity. And uh, this is a very simple law by which your mu s goes to your mu d thanks to a characteristic distance, then this is what we call a slip weakening frictional law. What we've described before was a velocity weakening here. It's a slip weakening. It means that friction weakens through with slip, right? Then first, in other what does this mean? Okay, if you have a solid surfaces that are two solid surfaces that are in contact without wear materials inside, the slip distance L represents the slip necessary to break to break the down adhesive contact junctions formed during the static contact. Okay, if you have a, two surfaces that are sliding one against the other one in a time dependent fashion, are right, just loading up now or not in a time dependent fashion, they are loaded, they are loading. Before this, the rupture happens, you would basically start rupturing the little adhesive spots, small spots on your, before you get the system started, okay? So this is exactly what is happening. So the slip weakening distance is also known as the critical slip or the breakdown slip, where in seismology we do not use much the breakdown, we use the critical slip, okay? The only problem of this law is that this is a law that you could apply for the, of your co-seismic slip. It fits one single stick slip instability, but it does not tell you how your mu d will recover. We'll get back to your mu s. It tells you how your mu s would go to your mu d thanks with a characteristic distance, but it does not tell you how your mu d would get back because friction has to recover at some point. The earthquake will stop because friction is recovering. 
and friction and the system starts healing, right? If we would like to get into estimates of, into understanding of the earthquake cycle, then the right low, at least for now, that we can see is called the rate and state. The rate and state is this, these are the initial plots of works that were done by Chris Maron. Here I'm plotting basically mu s versus your whole time using different tests, different samples that were run by different authors. Here it started with Jim Dietrich in 1972. Jim Dietrich is really in some ways the, uh, the rate and state started with Rowena. It's a paper in JGR in, in 1983, I think. And then uh, Dietrich started these experiments a long time ago. And then this is a group in USGS, and Nick Biller is also in USGS, and Chris Maron uh, followed up. And you see, still within up to 1997, there was a clear understanding that US is healing up with time. Now we know this is becoming like something well constrained. So there is a clear understanding that static friction is healing in time, then this is what we call healing. While if we look at friction versus velocity in the specific case within the dynamic domain, still using different investigators here up to Tullis and Weeks in 1986, you see that during your dynamic phase your friction is dropping down. So this is what we call the rate dependency. Okay? Here it's the state dependency, then the state refers to time. In this specific case, this is the timing within our earthquake cycle after the earthquake or before to some extent. And here, this is the velocity or rate dependency of your friction. And this is during our dynamic phase. This is when the rupture goes on. Okay, here we're talking about micrometer per second. And I would like to attract your attention to the dimensions here. Okay, and these are dimensions that are done in the lab many years ago, but now we're reaching values of the order of meters per second, and these are the initial, got started also by two listen weeks and the team in Japan and Giulio Di Toro, who spent some time in Japan doing this as well. Now they have a lab here in Padova and in Rome, and is another person that came here to ICTP Last year, his name is Marco Scuderi, that he's doing this, and he happens to be a student of Chris Maron. So now, there's a fairly well-constrained behavior that we understand that a new dynamic goes really close to zero values during the sleep weakening, during the velocity weakening process. Okay. And the good thing of the, this is what we call then, the rate and state, this is the rate dependency of friction, this is the state dependency, these are empirical relationships, okay, that are coming from the lab experiment. And if you compare this to the slip weakening low, these lows, they do allow the static friction to recover, to heal up. So this is a low that would apply to the earthquake cycle. Now this is a low that would satisfy what we've been learning, okay, then the rate dependent effect is this one. When you move to your slow and fast, and then you're fast and slow, okay, then if the sliding velocity V is changing, then the resistance of sliding also changes. This is your friction versus time. This is what we call the rate dependency. If you look at what we call the state dependent effect, and the state dependent effect here is C or D sub C within the, before you get into your velocity weakening process, then your D sub C that represents the critical distance over which the rupture has to be, to get initiated. Okay? Then if we apply this to all the earthquake cycle, then we have to combine them. Then if we combine the rate effect and the state effect, this is what we will see. And this is exactly the combined rate and state effect 
and this is slip versus friction, okay, by which you have two different, two different elements that are jumping in. This is called A and B. A, it's in some way the mechanical property of the material before rupture, and B is in some ways the mechanical parameter B of the symbol after the rupture. And if your A minus B is depending whether A minus B is over zero or is, is uh, depending on, on, the, on, on, the, on this quantity, you could talk about velocity weakening or velocity strengthening. And this is something that we will see as well during this, this course. Now the rate and state dependent friction is, has been defined has been very well described in Ruina in 1980R. Please look at this paper. This is a JIGR paper. It's the Journal of Geophysical Research. You have it in the library. It would be nice for you if you look at it. Okay. Take home point, it's, it's an empirical relationship. It's fully based on laboratory experiments. The second one is, the second take home point, it describes the evolution of friction with slip, velocity, and time. And it accounts for the velocity weakening, the fault weakening, I'm sorry, it accounts for the phase of weakening of the fault when it generates the earthquake. And it accounts also for the phase of healing, and this is your post-seismic phase. So here, this seems to be a law that works fairly well for the earthquake cycle. Okay? So thanks to this law, we can understand, we can further understand the earthquake cycle. So there are two, we keep using always the same word here, this is static and dynamic frictions that are the two different ways by which you describe your friction, the behavior of your friction. But however, the time dependent effects are seen and a description of these can help understand different processes when we talk about D sub C, we're talking about nucleation processes. It's when it's right before the earthquake gets started. Okay? So that there you're getting into nucleation processes that we'll be looking at. We're talking about earthquake triggering processes. When you trigger an earthquake, and triggering is something that we will describe as well. Okay? Here it's not, it's something that follows the loading process. First, you need a loading machine and an earthquake could be triggered later on, even prior that the loading would allow for the failure. Means that you could have even something that happens out of the fault itself that would lead to a triggering. You could have fluid circulations, you could have far field stresses, you could have uh, fracking, injection of fluid by, for oil and gas and so on and so forth that would allow for the rupture to go ahead. Uh, this allows, and the rate and state allows also to have a uh, sort of an, uh, an understanding of how four shocks do take, or why four shocks do take place. Or understand a little bit, this is getting you into issues of physics of earthquake prediction, okay, which happens prior to the main shock. Or this is called also understanding precursors to large earthquakes. So the first Empirical relationship that we've seen for the friction is Amonton law. Amonton law is shear stress equal sigma equal call mu sigma n. Very simple one that basically varies if you look at high stress regions or low stress regions. While the formulation of your rate and state is exactly this one. This is the empirical relationship itself, which is still simple if you have to look at it into a very simplistic way, while if you have to solve this and apply this to real false, it becomes a little bit more complicated, of course. Then our shear stress here, it's not anymore your single friction versus sigma n that we've seen with the Hamilton law, but here we're including different guys here. This is, we're adding into mu zero, which is the initial coefficient of friction before you get into the velocity jump, okay? And A is basically your experimentally determinate constant of your medium before the earthquake takes place. And B is basically after. And your V is basically your displacement rate 
okay? And V0 is your initial displacement rate before you get into V, okay? And this is basically your rate effect. This is what you see when you have your jump in velocity, when you're moved from your initial velocity, and then you have your jump in velocity. This is what we call the rate effect, by which your dynamic friction is going to very small values. And this is what we call the state effect. And this is your state variable. Theta is your state variable. And d sub c is basically your critical distance, your critical slope distance. Then this formulation mimics still the Hamilton's law to some extent, but it provides far more constraint to your friction as friction depends on slope, time in some ways, and velocity. Right? So this is the empirical relationship that we use for now as far as the earthquake cycle is concerned. I think that with this I will stop now and then we will reconvene at the next lecture.